use your uh, your Wikipedia as a uh, intro here, Warren? Can no, sell don't it. use that. No, no, it's uh, been vandalized by. Uh... Oh, sorry, you're you're joking. I thought you were serious. Well, no, the first part is pretty. It's on it's on point except it ends with uh, the fact that you build yourself the prince of darkness so why don't you just take some time and introduce yourself to the people that might be listening or watching today warren Kinsella is my guest uh hi uh i'm warren i'm uh, a lawyer author uh, law professor political consultant and a bad musician yeah, bad new musician. Awesome. Warren, I appreciate your time today, brother. You're so politically connected. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, what do we call you, an operative, a political operative? Uh, I guess, you know, a consultant. You know, people okay. hire me to work on campaigns and, and political campaigns and help them out. And uh, that's what we do at the Daisy Group. Cool. Founder of the Daisy Group. And Warren, tell us a little bit about the end of the days of the most recent federal campaign and, and your departure from uh, taking a break, at least from social media. What, what was working on you there? How are you, how are you feeling about it? Well, what happened there was we had hired uh, someone uh, who stole a bunch of documents, uh, basically, uh, on a contract. And that person... Uh, circulated the uh, the documents to some people in the media and some political operatives who were not fans of mine and they tried to do all kinds of damage and uh, they did do some some damage and it was um, mainly about work we're very proud of we were working um, we've been opposing racism as i think you know because that was the last time we talked for example, we took on a neo-Nazi newspaper uh, that was uh, published here in Toronto for years, fortunately. Uh, we're trying to change the name of a street in Pooslich, Ontario, called Swastika Trail. We do that kind of work, and we're known for that kind of work. And we got hired to uh, basically uh, do research on the racists who had gotten involved with the People's Party of Canada. You know, for example... One of the people that Elections Canada allowed to certify the People's Party was a guy who had been the leader of a group called the National Alliance. National Alliance is a neo-Nazi terrorist group in the United States um, that was involved in the bombing of the o uh, Alfred P. Murrah building in Oklahoma City in 1995, where 168 men, women, and kid children were, were murdered. So, um, you know, it... This issue isn't just a problem in the United States, it's a problem in Canada too. And uh, we're very proud to do that kind of work and we've been hired to help out on that. And um, how that could be a controversy, uh, that makes no sense to me. You know, the media uh, along with us had been, you know, correctly pointing out that Bernier's People's Party was racist for months and they, I guess, decided one weekend to make him a victim. Uh, at that point, I just said to hell with it. I had too many people uh, inviting me to kill myself or making threats, so I just took off, took a break from uh, social media, and it was great. And I encourage everybody else to do that periodically. Yeah, you got to have a thick skin for sure. And I, I've learned a little bit how to, you know, let it roll off my back when it's just, you know, Super Skater '95 with the, you know, no picture and he's anon. But I mean, when it comes from your friends and 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 people that think they know you, and then their comments are something like, "What happened to you?" Like this whole idea that, you know, I'm better than you. You've obviously gone to the dark side and, and what happened type of thing. So is it more based in people that know you that got to you or is it, is it a matter no, of... No, no. I mean, the, the thing that everybody needs to keep in mind, you know, I have 42,000 followers on Twitter and the vast majority of them use fake names and fake pictures. Mm -hmm. and they pretend to be somebody other than the, who they are. You know, and some of them are okay people, but, you know, you get some people on there who are jerks and are racists or sexist or Islamophobes or anti-Semites. And so they're bad people, right? Mm -hmm. they're, that's the regrettable part of social media. Social media is good in that it's given a lot of people a voice they wouldn't have otherwise had. Mm -hmm. But it's also allowed people to do terrible things. And so when I encounter those people, I block them or I report them 
but you know, I don't let them get under my skin. But the you know the recent election thing, it was just uh, it was nutty. It was out of control. So um, you know, I just turned it off, and that's why I say to others, if you know you feel like you're under siege, mm-hmm. uh, particularly this happens to women a lot on social media, um, and just turn it off. You know, they can't get to, get you then. And uh, but you know, if somebody makes a threat. If somebody threatens to cause you physical harm. You got to raise it with the police. Yeah, and I get uh, y- y- your uh, your labels that you're throwing around. I think we're throwing them around a lot lately. But do you consider that white supremacy or racism or anything of the like? It seems to be the first. I I don't know where to classify you politically. I think you've done work for everyone. You classify yourself as an independent. Yeah, independent. yeah like but it's most Canadians. I voted for all political parties. I donated to all political. Right. Except for Bernier's, right. and I've got friends in all political parties. I'm an independent. Yeah, and I I appreciate that. And uh, when it comes around to it, like I said, what do you think the the if you were to rate uh, the problems and the issues that we're facing today, that racism and Islamophobia and all these labels, and it seems to come more so from the left. I find is that you know they just don't want to talk, and as soon as you disagree with them, they call you a racist. So. How do you how do you classify that as like problems or issues that we're facing today? It's a huge problem right now. You think so, eh? No, I know so. Hmm. And uh, there has been an explosion in hate related violence and crime in Canada, in the United States, and in Western Europe since about 2016. <clears throat> Three things uh, of note have taken place: um, the election of Donald Trump licensed and encouraged these individuals, these hateful individuals and groups to get more bold, you know, from their perspective, one of their own is in the most powerful office in the land. In Britain, you have Brexit on the right, that uh, really in the main was more about anti-immigrant and refugee sentiment than anything else. And then you've got a leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, who's openly anti-Semitic. So it's a problem on the right and the left. The thing I, you know, I caution anybody listening um, is that, you know, no ideology, no side has got a monopoly on virtue. There is racism and anti-Semitism on the right, and it exists on the left too. It's a problem in every region of Canada. There's no province, for example, that is better than another province in terms of this problem and it's become a bigger problem since 2016 because people in a position of power uh, the so-called populace embrace these points of view and you know it understandably the racist groups and the anti-semitic groups are encouraged by that they feel emboldened by that they feel validated by that and um, it's a big big problem i've been tracking this stuff for more than 30 years uh, on both the right and the left, and I've never seen it as bad as it is right now. Uh, you know, I tend to, I agree to a point with you. I, I, I kind of fell into the idea that we're more politically divided than we ever have been. Men and women seem to be further apart than we ever have been. But then I look at it and I go, you know, you kind of hit on this earlier in the conversation about everyone's got a voice. So it's the radicals and the extremes that seem to have a louder voice. And and I agree with you from the standpoint that this anti-Semitism seems to be coming from right and left, but especially when we look down south, of, you know, coming from the squad, it, it, you know, if you're Don Cherry and you say, yeah, you people that come here, you're a racist and you get canceled. But if you're, I don't know, AOC or uh, Tlaib or whatever, you can have all kinds of anti-Semitic tropes and uh hints and memes and stuff like that and and for some reason it seems they they get a pass how do you feel about that yeah i i don't give them a pass Mm -hmm. and i condemn both Mm -hmm. and i'm saying that very clearly the problem right now is people on the right for example you know don you give the don cherry example he did make racist statements in the past you know i'm Mm -hmm. I'm not i don't know if you people amounts to that Mm -hmm. but he did Right. And folks who, you know, are classify themselves as conservatives are okay with that. And then people on the left are give AOC a break because they like her. Mm-hmm. And the thing that's made it worse is social media. You know, back in the, the old days, I guess I'm showing what an old guy I am. We would talk to each other. Mm. You know, we would reach out to each other. I, I, I met President Bush today, uh, this week. 
he was speaking at a conference and I spoke just before him and he was amazing. You know, mm-hmm. and he was somebody who I previously was very critical of. I take him in a New York minute now. Mm-hmm. And he was talked about his friendship with the Obamas and how something it wasn't he really expected to have happen. And he said, you know, the, the damn problem is we just don't connect with each other anymore. We don't talk to each other anymore. But people, you know, you can disagree with somebody but not hate their guts. Mm-hmm. You know, you can disagree with somebody's point of view and still accept that they're a friend. Or, or somebody who has got value or have kids like you. Mm-hmm. And that's where I'm at. The people I don't like you know, the most are these hardcore partisans who have blinkers on, they have blinders on, and they're never prepared to accept that their side makes mistakes too, mm-hmm. on the right and the left. I appreciate that. And, and staying with politics there, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, this? Do you think we have a double standard? Do you think it's equally, you know, we've got Don Cherry and then we've got Jessica Allen. And it really seems like, you know, I love grapes and, and I don't want to be measured by what I said 20 years ago. And I know he said some things that you, you would consider racist for, you know, Swedes. They're wearing the visors and they're not tough and they don't fight. And, you know, they're not playing a certain type of hockey. And, you know, I kind of cut him a pass. He's grapes. He's from a different uh, era. And and the fact that he said something like that 20 years ago when we weren't so anal about it and just dissecting every word and every syllable apart. And then he says something like this and he's gone. And then J- Jessica Allen comes out on the CTV's The Social and, and does a white supremacy, like a very critical of white hockey players. And she's still... She doesn't, she doesn't uh, you know, uh, apologize. She comes on and justifies it, and, and she's still got a job. So you think we, we suffer from a little bit well, of a double she standard? Did, she did apologize from, well, that was, from what I saw. Yeah. Um, well, I think they're both idiots. Mm. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't think, you know, I think they're both idiots. I don't like either one of them. You think they both and deserve to that, lose their job as well? I, no, I don't think people should lose their jobs for making mistakes. Right. You know, and we're doing too much of that these days. You know, if somebody comes out and says something just egregiously, horribly over the top, well, yeah, their bosses need to take a look at that because these people are on the public airwaves. They're owned by you and me. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I don't think, I'm not into, you know, President Obama talked about this recently, you know, this tendency to cancel people. Mm. Like, I got canceled, too, Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I didn't even get asked. I was on News Talk 1010. Mm-hmm. And they decided to can me because they uh, heard that I was working for uh, a political party to expose racism. And it's like, well, yeah, I was working to expose racism. And uh, I always thought to be fair and transparent and open about, you know, my views. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, I got canceled. So anyway, I'm not going to sit around and, and cry in my milk about it. And, you know, that's just the way it is. And mm-hmm. I don't agree with their decision, but that's the decision they made. But I think if your point is, that, you know, we're just punishing people, taking away their livelihood, taking away their jobs, taking away their reputation because they make one mistake. I don't agree with that mm-hmm. because... The, Everybody makes mistakes. I I agree completely, and and they all deserve a second chance. And you know what I find uh, hilarious, for lack of a better term, is the idea that you know you say something that's taken out of context, or it's not understood the way you meant it to, or in Grape's uh, situation, he just he just delivered it badly. But if you come back to a man and you say. You know, hey, Don Cherry, are you racist? And he says, no, of course I'm not racist. You know, I kiss that black kid on TV, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so don't you feel like, you know, that these people should have a chance to correct themselves and you should have to take them at their word pending any proof or action that that proves that they are what you're accusing them of? Well, sure, yeah. No, people should always be given an upper chance. You know, I'm a good Irish Catholic, or I mm-hmm. try to be one. And people should always be given an opportunity to atone. And mm-hmm. they should always be given an opportunity to explain themselves because all of us make mistakes. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like Jim, if they're making the same mistake 12 times, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. You know, yeah. At a certain point, we're entitled to form a judgment that, um, you know, that's actually who they are mm-hmm. and their apologies really don't matter. And, you know, I think that's the judgment a lot of people have formed about the pr- Prime Minister Trudeau as he's apologized a lot about uh, a lot of different behavior, you know, whether it's the Aga Khan or SNC Lavalin or blackface or whatever. But he, you know, he keeps 
making the same mistakes in judgment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why a lot of us just said, you know, uh, we, we need to make a change. This, this guy just, he's great at apologies, but he's not good at changing his personal behavior. Awesome. Now, uh, I'm a 10-time Green. I ran for the leadership in 2006. Uh, I was, well, part of the, the group that, you know, informally recruited Elizabeth May. She was a star, at the t still a star, and great for the party. Uh, uh, I appreciate that she stepped down. One, because we can have a, I, listen to me, we. I haven't been Green for a long time. I still say we because of my loyalty, but, uh, you know, they haven't had a leadership race or even a conversation about it since 2006. So, and I was really surprised when it came out that you were working with them. I didn't, I don't know how far that went or, or what happened there, but speak to us uh, about your relationship with the Greens at the in, during the election there. Well, that I can disclose because they gave permission for us to do so. Okay. One of my guys. Yeah, normally uh, you wouldn't Tom talk Hennifer, about clients. Yeah. One of my guys, Tom Hennifer, um, ran their war room. I helped them get it started. And, um, um, you know, it was something that we were comfortable doing. Um, and, you know, I, not so much her, but, you know, the, uh, I met some amazing people in the Green Party, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you did, mm -hmm. and uh, smart, well-intentioned people who had the best interests of the country at heart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we need more of those kinds of people. Ms. May, you know, I don't want to be critical, uh, too critical of her, but I'm glad that she's leaving. Um, I think that she had turned the Green Party a little bit into a cult of personality. It was more about her and her views than the party. And, um, you know, uh, she may had a number of chances to improve the party's position. And, you know, uh, what has the Green Party got now? Two MPs that it didn't have. Um, you right. know, a couple of years ago, that's not good enough. You know, when right. you look at the Green Party's position in the polls, it should have done much better. And so she needed to take responsibility for that, and I guess she has. You know, what do you think they need to do to become more mainstream, get some more people in there? Because, you know, I'm ideologically opposed to much of their stuff now. I, I don't know. I grew up in my first election. I was 24 years old. I was ideologically possessed to the left. And as I grew older, I, you know, I've had more educated conversations and debates about the issues that matter to me. Number one, free speech, but there's others. And I've kind of gone away from them. You know, I still kind of lean socially left, but I think I'm more a moderate now. And, and on some issues, I'm, I'm right, straight conservative. And that's not a bad thing. My friends don't really recognize me so much. But what do you think the, the Greens need to do to become more mainstream and have more success? Because they certainly have a role. Well, I don't, I, I don't worry about ideology. Uh, you know, I think people have lots of views. Regular people have lots of views on the right and, and the left. And I saw that in the Green Party. There were people who were physically conservative and uh, mm -hmm. you know, progressive in terms of environmental issues. Right. I think what they need to do is, well, firstly, they have to have a change in leadership, which they're now going to have. So that's good. Mm -hmm. They need to get rid of her because she's just she's been there too long. Right. And, yep. and she had an effect. I think, you know what I'm talking about. She intimidated people within the party and they were afraid to come forward. Oh, and it's become right. the Elizabeth May party, including yeah. controlling so, the board of directors, which, you know, is how she got to a point where she didn't have to face a leadership contest for 13 right. years or what have you. So she's ancient history. She's gone. And uh, good luck to you. But the, in terms of what the party needs to do, you know, the polling shows consistently the Canadians favor um, taking action on climate change. They agree that it's a problem. Younger people feel it's the number one problem. And it is It is a huge problem. I was in the Yukon last week, and I was you know, talking to a couple of First Nations people and how beautiful it is. And they're like, yeah, well, all the water you're looking at, all that land you're looking at is usually covered by snow and ice. We've never seen it like it is right now. So climate change is real. What the problem is, and the polling shows this, is while people agree that it's real, they want something that, done about it they don't want to pay for it and um and i think the reason for that is not because you know people are selfish or, or dumb it's because they've seen governments too often squander taxpayer dollars they've seen governments act irresponsibly they need to see a government that treats you know their tax dollars with respect and then I think at that point, they'd be much more willing to uh, contribute to the fight against climate change. Mm -hmm. But right now, you know, when you have the government, uh, the Trudeau government, for example, being as reckless as it's been on some public expenditures, well, why would you trust those guys with carbon taxes, right? So it, it makes sense to me that the public, while concerned about the issue, 
uh, doesn't trust the uh, you know levels of government to, to deal with the issue. What's your prediction for the current government now in the minority situation? Uh, as I've grown older, I've kind of swung more right because those are, are the important issues to me, mostly, as I mentioned, freedom of speech. But uh, now we're in a minority situation. Uh, one, do you think we're going to shift further left, if you can, if that's possible, with uh, the NDP holding the balance of power? And how long do you think this, this government will last in a minority situation? Again, I just, I don't get hung up on the ideology stuff because, you know, your, your average person, you know, regular folks just don't see themselves as ideological. Mm. If you talk to them at the kitchen table, they're going to have views on the left and they're going to have views on the right and they're still a normal sure. person. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this government's um, lifespan is going to be determined by Mr. Shear. If he gets booted out at that leadership review in April in Toronto, um, and the Conservatives get a decent leader, and I would recommend to them they consider a woman who is, you know, pro-choice and from uh, Central Canada, because you know they had two leaders in a row from uh, from the West. They need to, you know, get somebody who appeals to Central Canada clearly because that's where they failed. Um, if they do that, watch out. Who do they have that's who? Who do they have that's a good female leader with the Conservatives? Uh, Ambrose Rate. Okay. Um, Mulroney, Carolyn Mulroney, mm -hmm. is a minister here in Ontario, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Mulroney is bilingual, you know, or you know, name recognition. She knows how to win. Um, Rate lost her seat, regrettably, and I say that as somebody who's a friend of hers. But I think she can come back from that. And uh, you know, Ambrose, while a Westerner. Uh, is somebody who's held in high regard too. So it Interesting. becomes pretty hard for Trudeau to fight a woman for all kinds of different reasons. <laughs> women stuck with him, I think reluctantly after blackface, but they did. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a female leader of the, of the Conservative Party, watch out. That mm. is a game changer. But it, you know, how long does it all last? Uh, history tells us the longest uh, that any uh, minority government lasts in Canadian history is about three years back in the 20s. Mm. Usually the average is about a year and a half. So mm -hmm. right now I'd say we're on track to a year and a half. How about provincially? What do you think? Doug, Doug Ford got the right people around him finally? Is he? Yeah, is, he does. Do you think he's saying? Named Jamie Wallace. And full disclosure, Jamie was my uh, editor when I wrote for the Toronto Sun. And he's just doing a, an amazing job. And uh, ministers are happier now. The staff are happier now. Doug is a is being allowed to be Doug, which is, is Doug, Doug's not an ideological person either. You know, he's a populist in the traditional sense. Mm. He's kind of a people guy. So they're allowing him to reconnect with people. They're not hiding him away. And, you know, while the government is still unpopular, it is by no means as unpopular as it was. Mm -hmm. So that's helping them out. And as long as Trudeau is prime minister, you know, Doug's got an excellent shot at uh, being reelected. Because his main opponent, you know, the Ontario Liberal Party, just has five seats at the moment. Hmm, interesting. What do you do? You think there's a practical, a practical, workable model outside of first past the post? Uh, well, we tried it. You know, as you know, in 2007, it was on the ballot in Ontario. This uh, mixed member representation thing. There were committees and studies done. But didn't the Liberals the kind of sell us out on that, though? They weren't weren't the well, kind of disingenuous in how they campaigned for. I was ran Don McGinty's war room that campaign, hmm. and he told us very clearly, and he was right. The political party, certainly his political party, should not interfere in that process. Hmm. The people should be given an opportunity, so it shouldn't become a partisan thing. Otherwise, it you know gets distorted. It's up to the people to decide whether they want that type of electoral system, and they overwhelmingly rejected it. So at that point, you know, I just hmm. say to all my Green and New Democrat friends, guys, <laughs> you had your shot. It was on the ballot in every riding, and you lost. Hmm. It's over. Interesting. What are, you, what are your thoughts down in the States as far as a Democratic leader to take on Trump? Well, I'm a Joe Biden guy. Okay. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, people say, you know, Joe makes verbal mistakes and they say he's too old and, you know, they say he's uh, out of touch. But they said all those things about Trump, didn't they? You know, mm -hmm. Trump won. So I think we need a centrist. I think, uh, you know, Senator Warren and and Senator Sanders are intelligent people, but, you know, I've lived in the States. I've worked for the Democratic Party. Um, as a matter of fact, I was just doing some work for the main Democratic Party this morning because I'm associated with them. And, um, like, you know, the United States is a conservative country. 
<laughs> it's just not going to embrace Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders for president. It's just not going to do that. And too far left, and, you think? Yeah. You need yeah. more moderation, more somebody that's yeah, more in more the middle. Yeah, more and that's mm -hmm. what Joe is. And do you, what do you think his chances of against Trump are? It looks like most of the polls don't well, fare him very well. Poll, he says he's going to win. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He'll win. So, uh, yeah, he's my guy. And, uh, you know, the others are very impressive people, and they'll make excellent members of his cabinet. But we, you know, I think we, those of us who are involved in the Democratic Party, need to get behind Trump. What do you think the main issues are that we're facing in Western democracies here, Warren? Is you know, I, I come around to more of the idea, you know, fatherlessness seems to be something that's really coming up for me over and over and over, especially in the states and the black communities. You know, you got eighty-five percent of single motherhood. Uh, you know, the, 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 once they change the welfare system to just say, you know, what you can't have a man in the house, it seemed to really be the downfall of boys and families. Uh, what do you think the like? What are the most some of the most important topics to you? You see in in Western civilization these days politically. Economy, uh, it's back as an issue. It's back as a concern. Uh, the uh, I think we're all seeing signs where you are, where I am, where it looks like the economy is starting to slip again. There's predictions that some economists are making that a recession is on the way. I don't know if that's so. I just know the last time we had a recession in 2009, none of us were very good at predicting its arrival. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's a great concern of mine because, you know, the Trudeau guy spent a lot during a time of economic growth. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to save during times of economic growth and mm -hmm. spend during times of recession and depression. And so their ability to spend and, you know, prime the pump of the economy has been constrained or is limited by the amount of spending that they did during good times. So I think that's a big, big mistake, and that's one that you know we may all come to regret quite a bit. Do you feel like we've just written fiscal responsibility off politically here? I mean, the, the, the taxpayer has an endless deep pocket, it seems. They, we don't seem to rally too much about anything as far, as far as finances go. But the government just keeps to spend, spend, spend. And I mean, we saw uh, Har Harper when he was in power. We had Jack Layton as the opposition holding the political gun to his head. He got more money out of Harper than any government ever. And I'm wondering if we're headed down that same road now with uh, the, liberal, the liberal prime minister and his cabinet with uh, the opposition, the official opposition being the NDP, or looking to be, on most things, looking to be the N NDP. But how, what's your take on fiscal responsibility? Well, it's going to happen again. It's a minority government, and in order to survive, Trudeau has to depend upon, you know, the Bloc Québécois, which is going to want more spending in Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, he has to depend on the NDP, and, you know, I guess the, the Green Party doesn't really matter. But yeah, a, you know, in order to survive, he has to spend, and so he's had a historical tendency to do that. I think he's going to do it again. Mm -hmm. So, um you know, people who are looking for fiscal responsibility over the next uh, two years, two and a half years, um, you're going to be sadly disappointed. What do you think the long-term impact of ignoring that is? Well, massive deficit, deficits and so on. You know, when I came in with Mr. Kretzky, I had the honor and privilege of working for him. I was his special assistant when he became leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. And, you know, The Economist was had on its front page that Canada was heading into third world status because of the yeah. um, ridiculous decisions that the Mulroney Conservatives had made and the spending decisions that they had made. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, no, I'm not going to get rid of GST. We need the revenue, and we need to get this country back and get mm -hmm. back the debt as a percentage of, of GDP that is reasonable. And he did that. And uh, I know a lot of Conservatives had tremendous admiration for what Mr. Kretschmann and Mr. Martin did when they were in government. Uh, including me in that. I've never been a guy that voted liberal, obviously being green uh, for so long and, and now, well, on the opposite side of it, it seems. But talk to me a little bit about your time with uh, Kretchen. Uh, well, I was a lawyer. Um, I was practicing law in this building in Ottawa, and he was in the building over, and it was connected by, you know, one of those mall things. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to see him lining up to get his own sandwich and, you know, <laughs> They go and sit down and look at the sports pages by himself. He didn't send down his secretary. He was just the regular guy. It was when he was out of politics. Mm. And I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. And um, when Meech Lake came along, I objected to the fact that 
you know, they wanted to stick a, an interpretive clause in the Constitution of Canada without first defining it. And he was the only politician around who had the same point of view. So I just said, hey, he needs some help. And they were more interested in the fact that I think that I've been a journalist than a lawyer. And uh, so I was a volunteer for him, and I stayed with him. And then uh, when he won, uh, he gave me uh, a call and said, come on, come have some fun. You know, you can always be a damn lawyer, but, you know, what I'm offering you a chance to do, you can't do very often. Wow. <laughs> so I had friends and family and colleagues saying, oh, you're making a big mistake, and he's never going to be prime minister. He's never going to win. And so I got to say to them all afterwards, so I guess he did okay, huh? He did all right. <laughs> Who do you consider was some of our uh, most effective leaders to be? Him. Yeah, over the history, yeah, you think Gretchen was number one? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah without a doubt. Uh, I was an admirer of the courage of Justin's father, but not always his decisions. Mm-hmm. I was an admirer of the mind of Mr. Harper, but not always his decisions. I was an admirer of Mr. Moroni for his conviction on South Africa and uh, free trade, because uh, he was right on both of those. And, he, uh, you know, he had to oppose Reagan and, and Thatcher on South Africa. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we've been well served by many of our leaders in the in this country. Some have been a disappointment, like uh, you know, Mr. Trudeau has been. But um, you know, we're a great democracy, and we uh, we're one of the greatest democracies in the world. And we will always, Canada will always be there. It will always survive. And we will um, prevail. And uh, I believe that is the case now. What's coming up for you? What do you see yourself in the future? I've got a few episodes of your podcast. It's uh, actually pretty enter- entertaining. And uh, what do you see, work-wise, what do you see you're working on uh, coming up? I'm going to continue to do what I do. I'm involved in fighting racism and uh, anti-Semitism. So I've been doing that for years. Um, I, I'm not involved in any political party other than the Democrats in the United States. So what I do here is if there's a conservative who's a friend, I'll help them out. If it's a new Democrat and a friend, I'll help them out. And I, I say a pox in the political parties. I think they're a big part of the problem. And I'm just not involved in political parties anymore. And uh, I'm not interested in that personally. I'm interested in helping out uh, individual people who I think would be uh, of service to the country, who would benefit the country, mm. and that's that's what I do. Appreciate it. Now, uh, before I let you go, and I appreciate your time. Thanks for keeping it a little long here. Um, who, who's uh, who? Who are the people that have supported you over the the dark days? You mean recently? Yeah. Doug Ford, Dalton McGinty, John Crenshaw, John Tory. Those be some of the known names. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can see there are people on the right and the left, right? Mm-hmm. You know, people come together and then, uh, you know, just friends and, and uh, family. You know, in politics, you get knocked around. I was talking to somebody about it yesterday. I said, it really is a blood sport. Oh, for it sure. It really is. Some people, it's not enough for them to disagree with you. They want to kill you. <laughs> they want to destroy you. They want you to lose everything. Mm. And... They're shitty, rotten people. And the key thing is, uh, you know, sometimes they get at me, right? Sometimes they get under my skin. Mm -hmm. But you got to say, no, that's not going to prevail. That is not going to win. I'm not going to let them take them, take me out. I'm going to push back and I'm going to fight back and I'm going to stand for the stuff that I believe in. And that's what I've done. And that's what all of those people I've named have encouraged me to do. And, um, uh, they haven't killed me yet. So I keep going. <laughs> yeah, and uh, do you think that's what keeps women out of it? Because it's such a, a, a blood sport, quote unquote. Do you think that they, you know, they just are turned off by? It? I think we all agree it, it, there's a place for more women in politics. I mean, I, I think if we had more women, we'd have a more compassionate, uh, I don't know, a society or. Uh, or, or resolutions that come down the pipe. Uh, I don't know, but what do you do? You think that that's discouraging women from getting involved? Just the the sheer nature of politics itself. Of course. Yeah. Of course. There's 16 women representing every political ideology um, in the recent mm-hmm. you know, the British election that's taking place right now, and every single one of them just said what you just said. I just right. got tired of all the crap and the threats and saying I'm going to rape you and I'm going to kill yeah. you, and they just said to hell with it. So you don't and, you don't believe that there's an oppression that's systemic that's keeping women out of it that like men don't want women in politics type of thing that that's not existing in today's society is it? Of course it is. Well, yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, they don't want it. Well, you know, like if somebody says to your wife, I want to rape you and throw you in a dumpster, that's what they said to my wife. Well, that that's not exactly encouraging their participation in public life, is it? No, I get that. So, I'm yeah, just... that is something. Women experience that more than men, mm. which is the very definition of systemic. Mm. So, yes, that is happening. Hmm. You know, yesterday was International Men's Day, and I had a good laugh to myself. I was eating a BLT at lunchtime. I was like, Christ, we, we get every other day. I didn't even know we needed a special day. <laughs> Was that you that said uh, somebody tweeted? And I I didn't I didn't retweet it, but I saw somebody remark, uh, "Men don't need a day; we'll just take any day we want." <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> now, women in politics have a much tougher time. Yeah. And you can ask Jody Wilson Raybould and Jane Phil about that. Mm. Appreciate it. Uh, any regrets, Warren? Sure, I got a list. Oh, you do you? Long <laughs> enough to show, and I gotta go. Okay. Yeah. How do we get a hold of you anyway? What's to touch you up other than Twitter, Warren? Uh, you people can find me on my website, warrenconsell.com. I got three different Facebook platforms on there. I'm over on Instagram. I'm not quite sure how I got there, but I'm currently <laughs> there. They can get me on Twitter. And, uh, I welcome criticism. I welcome, you know, people pointing out when I'm wrong. But, uh, you know, anybody who uh, gets a little too far, they're just going to get themselves blocked and too bad if they don't like it. There you go. Warren Kinsella, I appreciate the time. All the best to your wife and your You're family. Welcome. And I hope to talk to you soon. I appreciate the time. Thank Thanks you. so much. All right. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye. Warren Kinsella, if you need him. Interesting conversation. Man, do I disagree with that guy a lot on some of the issues. A lot of the issues. Systemic sexism is keeping women out of politics. I don't know, man. I don't know. But uh, I appreciate the time. Thank you, Warren. Uh, I've been chasing you for a while. Uh, thank you to Katie uh, for lining that up. It's been a long time. Busy, man. Find him on Twitter, uh, warrenkinsella.com or at Kinsella Warren. So first name or last name first, first name last on the Twitter. Warrenkinsella.com. And uh, if you think the information here is useful, like, share. This interview is going to go offline, um, only because this is just a cheap way of doing it. We actually have like microphones and, and other good stuff here to make the sound better. <laughs> but uh, so we'll do a little edit. We'll put some titles up for Warren, how to get a hold of them. Uh, thank you for the people that watched. But uh, again, uh, this will be over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jim Fannin is where you find it online it's pretty much everywhere at jim fannin or at jim fannin show i uh, appreciate you coming in today and appreciate the time that warren kinsella's gave uh, kinsella gave us so uh find them online and uh like and share if you find it interesting peace out yo peace out yo